morning everyone. On behalf of Senzo Engineering Private Limited, we would like to thank all of you busy people for giving us your valuable time, especially the Honorable Chairman. We thank NHAI for giving us this opportunity to present a paper on guardrails and road safety. Let me give you a brief about our company and what we do. We are the leading manufacturers and suppliers of metal beam crash barriers in India and overseas as per, as per international standards. Now I would like to introduce you to Dr. Malcolm H. Ray, who has been a friend, guide, technical consultant, and advisor to our company. Dr. Ray became the Ralph H. White Distinguished Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts. Dr. Ray is a registered professional engineer at the state of Tennessee and Iowa and is the director of Impact Engineering Program. He was involved in evaluating and performing hundreds of full-scale vehicle crash test experiments involving a wide variety of cart rails, bridge rails, uh, and other roadside features. Dr. Ray spent almost four years as an on-site support contractor for the Federal Highway Administration at the Turner Fairbank Highway Research Center in Mecklen, USA, where he was instrumental in bringing new no-linear no dynamic finite element techniques. He has published nearly 80 journal, 80 journal articles, conference papers, and reports on various aspects of highway and road safety. Thank you. Thank you. It's my uh, pleasure to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for being uh, here on uh, uh, Saturday morning. Uh, my, uh, my topic today, as Senzo mentioned, uh, was... Uh, through my presentation today. If you have any questions, feel free to, to stop me uh, as we go along, uh, and I, I'd be happy to try and uh, answer them. And uh, also let me know if, uh, if you're having, having trouble hearing or understanding me. I, I know I speak uh, in a strange accent, and, uh, and my, uh, my Hindi's not very good, so uh, you wouldn't want, wouldn't want to hear it. So, uh, so our, our question for today is, uh, why guardrails? Why do we need guardrails on our, uh, on our roadway? Um, uh, all uh, highway agencies, uh, whether they're here in India or the, or the states or anywhere worldwide, uh, we always have more roadway miles that we want to build than we have money to build them with. So uh, why spend money on guardrails? Well, uh, if, uh, if things are going well when you're driving down the road and the weather conditions are, are good and, uh, and there are no problems in sight, uh, we don't think about, uh, about crash barriers. Uh, but when we need them, uh, we need them uh, uh, badly. Uh, so we don't think about crash barriers unless we have uh, uh, an accident or we see a collision when suddenly we need those crash barriers uh, there. And, of course, if we wait until then, it's, it's, uh, it's too late to do anything uh, about it. This is a, a case where a vehicle uh, struck a, a, a bridge, and the bridge rail didn't hold the vehicle, and the vehicle uh, went through the bridge rail and landed upside down in a, uh, in a small uh, river underneath the, uh, underneath the bridge. So if there had been a, a proper guardrail uh, there, uh, this accident wouldn't have been uh, prevented. Uh, well, why, why do cars leave the road? And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, in, 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 uh, in the U.S. we have an expression, preaching to the choir. I know you're, you're a highway professional, so you are, you're sensitive to this. But there are lots of reasons why people uh, leave the road. Uh, driver fatigue, uh, speeding, uh, abusing drugs and, uh, and alcohol. These are all things that people do that are irresponsible behaviors, uh, but they cause them to, to engage in poor driving behavior. And also there are things we have no control over. Uh, weather, uh, ice, uh, we have this wonderful deli fog that you, uh, you have. Uh, we have no control over uh, weather conditions. Uh, and sometimes vehicle uh, components uh, break down. So all these things uh, can go into uh, creating hazardous uh, situations for the driver uh, on the road. Well, uh, we presume, uh, especially uh, in, our, in our days with modern vehicles, uh, modern vehicles are carefully uh, uh, designed for safety. Uh, in the U.S., it's estimated that uh, some 11,000 lives have been saved by seatbelts uh, each year, uh, and uh, cars nowadays have uh, airbags, automatic braking systems, lots and lots of safety features. Uh, so you might say, well, uh, we don't have to worry about building a safe roadside because we are, we're driving around in these, uh, in these safe cars. But uh, there are roadside uh, or there are 
crash scenarios that uh, even the best uh, equipped vehicle can't uh, save us from. We saw the uh, earlier slide was a side impact into a utility pole. Here we have a rollover crash. The slide before we saw a vehicle upside down in a river. These are crashes that uh, uh, the vehicle safety measures uh, don't really work very effectively uh, in. So just driving a, a well-equipped safe car uh, isn't uh, all the insurance that we need. Uh, uh, on a more global uh, basis, uh, and, and uh, you being uh, government uh, uh, officials, this is uh, kind of where you uh, operate, roadside safety is also a social concern. Uh, highway crashes, it, it's uh, interesting. Uh, in 1990, road uh, traffic crashes were the cause of death, uh, were the ninth leading cause of death uh, in the world, both in the developing world and in the developed world. Uh, and that actually leads war. War was only number 16. Uh, road traffic accidents are, uh, are number nine. Uh, crime, uh, violence there, is, is number 19. So traffic accidents are, are uh, in most of our countries in the world, one of the highest uh, killers uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, it's projected by the year 2020, the uh, part of the slide on the right, that tro traffic accidents uh, will, uh, account, will be the third leading cause of death uh, in the world because the uh, traffic volume and number of vehicles is increasing rapidly, especially in the developing uh, uh, world. So um, uh, traffic accidents are, are a leading cause of, uh, of death and injury uh, in our world uh, today. And, uh, and we know how much attention and how, much, and how important it is to uh, worry about uh, the occurrence of war or the prevention of crime or the prevention of disease. And we focus a lot of uh, uh, attention and money on those problems. But uh, traffic accidents are just as important because uh, they also are a leading uh, uh, contributor to the worldwide uh, uh, fatality uh, score. If we look at uh, traffic fatalities worldwide, um, uh, we see that, uh, uh, unfortunately, India is, is leading the world in fatalities. Of course, you're the second most populous nation in the world, so that's not uh, surprising. But uh, if my uh, statistics here are correct, uh, there, are some, there are over 200,000 people uh, injured or fatally injured per year uh, in India. So there are, there's, there's a, a large toll in, uh, in human fatality uh, here, in, uh, here in India. And uh, you notice in, uh, in other parts of uh, the developing world, in, uh, in Africa and China, uh, also have large fatality uh, numbers as well. Uh, in, uh, in some of the uh, developed countries where, uh, where road uh, building has been going on for a longer period of time, uh, the, uh, the numbers of fatalities are much less. Of course, this, the size of these countries is also much less. But um, the point here is that there's a tremendous opportunity uh, for, uh, for you, for, uh, for engineers and for government officials in India uh, to make a big difference in reducing that uh, fatality number. Uh, just some more statistics. Uh, based on the uh, number of fatalities per 10,000 registered uh, vehicles, uh, in Bombay, uh, my uh, statistics uh, showed that uh, the fatality rate there is uh, one, or I'm sorry, 11.6 fatalities per uh, 10,000 registered uh, vehicles. Uh, in um, in uh, cities like New York and Los Angeles in the States, it's about one-tenth of that, uh, 1.6 fatalities per uh, 10,000 registered vehicles. So, so once again, there's a tremendous opportunity for, for you to make uh, big uh, strides in reducing the fatality uh, rate uh, for, your, uh, for your citizens. Uh, and also in the, uh, in the developed countries, the fatality rate has been decreasing. It's been going down by 20 or so percent per year, where it's, whereas it's been exploding in, uh, in Africa and, and Asia, uh, primarily because the, uh, the amount of traffic and the number of cars is increasing in those, uh, in those countries. So there's, a, there's tremendous room for uh, Im improvement in, um, uh, in the developing world. Well, one, uh, one thing you might think, well, uh, how you know, are we powerless to make things better? If, uh, if there are more vehicles on the road, if there are... Uh, more people traveling on the road, uh, maybe that's just the price of, uh, of living in a, uh, you know, in, a, in a crowded and congested uh, uh, country. Uh, but that's not uh, really true. Just using the U.S. as an example, in 1966, uh, from 1966 until now, the uh, number of vehicle miles traveled has increased almost 300%. Uh, so people are driving much, much more today in the year 2002 than they were in 1966. Uh, there are many more vehicles, 226% more vehicles uh, registered today in the U.S. than there were in 1966. 
uh, yet, the number of fatalities or the number of fatal uh, traffic accidents in the U.S. has actually decreased from a little under 51,000 uh, to just about 41,000 uh, today. So even though the number of vehicles is increasing, the number of uh, or the amount of vehicle use is increasing, uh, the number of fatalities is is dropping. And um, just some more of that. In 1956, if you do the math, the um, the fatal rate was 5.5 fatal injuries per hundred. Uh, actually, that should be per hundred million vehicle miles traveled. Um, now it's a, a fifth of that. It's 1.1 um, fatalities per hundred million vehicle miles traveled. So the uh, the fatality rate has uh, come way down. It's only 20 percent of what it was in in 1966. So why? Uh, you might ask. Well, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, vehicles are safer uh, today. Um, people drive uh, more responsibly once they're uh, educated uh, today. But uh, another big reason, and the reason why we're here today, is roadsides are much safer today than they were 40 years ago. The way we build roads has, uh, has improved. Uh, so with new road building uh, uh, technology and, and knowledge, we can build much safer roads. And guardrails or crash barriers are a big component uh, of that. So uh, we're here to talk about uh, guardrail uh, crash barriers, and uh, they have a role to play in, uh, in reducing the, uh, the injuries and fatalities on the road. Uh, and this is just to show that in, uh, in countries that have been uh, building uh, roads uh, for a long while and that have a, a, a track record of, uh, of building safe roads, uh, the fatality rate uh, in all those countries, the U.S., the uh, United Kingdom, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada, uh, that trend is a worldwide trend, not just a, uh, not just a, a, a short-term uh, local uh, effect. Uh, well, let's talk about guardrail uh, in particular. What is, uh, is guardrail? Of course, guardrail is a particular kind of roadside uh, crash barrier uh, that we install on the roads uh, uh, in order to keep people from striking ob obstacles or getting involved in hazardous situations uh, on the road. Uh, this is data from the U.S. I'm sure if we uh, did a similar study here in India, the, the distribution of things would be a little bit different, but, um, but uh, the point is still the same. Uh, the kinds of, of obstacles that guardrails uh, shield the motorists from are things like trees, uh, utility poles, uh, culverts, uh, steep embankments, uh, the ends of bridges, and, and we could go uh, on and on. There are lots of, uh, basically any fixed object along the side of the road, we can use a guardrail to uh, shield people from uh, striking that, uh, that object. Um, just a little bit of, uh, of nomenclature here. Uh, when we uh, say guardrail, uh, we generally mean uh, this kind of uh, a system. This is a uh, uh, the strong post W-beam uh, guardrail. The W-beam is the, uh, the W-shaped uh, profile that, uh, uh, that I'm sure you're familiar with and that uh, Senjo Engineering uh, produces. Uh, that, that profile uh, has been one that's been used uh, uh, internationally since, uh, since the late 50s. Uh, so it's, a, it's based on the material spec uh, from ASHTO, the American uh, Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, uh, standard number uh, M180. Uh, so that standard has been around for, uh, for a long time. We have a lot of experience with uh, uh, manufacturing and testing uh, guardrails of that type. So the rail itself is a Ashto M180 rail. Uh, the blockout is the uh, next piece, the spacer piece between the post and the rail. Uh, here I'm showing a wooden uh, blockout, but uh, you, there are actually a variety of kinds of blockouts we can use. Uh, wooden blockouts are used. Uh, recycled plastic blockouts uh, have become popular in some countries. Um, you can use uh, a steel uh, hot rolled uh, section like the post uh, section, an I steel section. Or you can use channel uh, steel sections. So there are a variety of uh, post uh, types that, uh, that you can use. And uh, since uh, I've been here in India, I've noticed that, uh, that most of your uh, blockouts are either uh, steel channel sections or uh, steel I beam sections. So that, and that's pretty, uh, pretty typical. Uh, the post as well can be a variety of things. Uh, in some places, um, Wood is used uh, in the world where I live in the U.S. Uh, wood is uh, wood is cheap, so we use a lot of wooden guardrail posts. Uh, steel uh, I beams are also widely used throughout the world. Also, uh, C uh, channel sections, uh, steel channel sections, are also used throughout the world. So um, all of those post types and blockout types are are used. And usually, the uh, the reason for choosing one over the other is is local uh, uh, availability of materials and and the economics of construction. But they can all be used to to perform equally. 
Uh, this basic system has been used in the U.S. for, uh, for a half a century. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, experience in installing it, maintaining it, um, testing it. Uh, and it's also by far the most common crash barrier in the world. Uh, I did a project for the uh, National Cooperative Highway Research Program a few years ago where we surveyed all the states in the U.S. as to what kinds of uh, crash barrier hardware they used. And every state in the U.S. uses one variety or another of this uh, particular uh, barrier. And uh, uh, I know uh, in Europe, uh, especially in Northern Europe, this is a very popular uh, barrier. In Canada, it's a very popular barrier. So it has a, uh, it's a very common worldwide uh, uh, barrier. Uh, a little more uh, information ab uh, about it. The uh, W-beam rail section, as I mentioned, is the Ashto M180 uh, rail section that, uh, that you also use here in India. Uh, the uh, post spacing, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the rail itself is 305 millimeters uh, wide, uh, 12 gauge, which is 2.83 millimeters uh, thick before the galvanizing. And it's a 50 KSI steel. So this basically just represents Ashto M180 steel. So that's the, uh, the component that um, uh, Senzo Engineering uh, manufactures. And again, it's the, the same one used all over the world. Uh, the posts are typically spaced at 1905 uh, millimeters with the, re the reason we have that odd number uh, is, is kind of just uh, historical uh, interest. It, it could be two meters, I suppose. But uh, um, uh, nine, 1905 is uh, what's, what's uh, pretty common. Rail is usually mounted at uh, 685 millimeters or so above the, uh, above the ground. And as I mentioned, uh, a variety of post types and blockout types uh, uh, have been used uh, successfully um, around the world. So how does it work? Well, here, here we have a crash test uh, that was done a few years ago at uh, Texas Transportation Institute uh, for me. Uh, uh, either fortunately or unfortunately, in the U.S., most of our crash testing nowadays are, are done with pickup trucks, which, uh, which is a uniquely American vehicle. Uh, in, in all my worldwide travels, I've, I have rarely seen a pickup truck any place except the U.S. Uh, but it, uh, it weighs about 2,000 uh, kilograms, so it's a, a relatively uh, heavy in terms of a passenger uh, vehicle. And the reason we use it is it's, very, it's a very uh, kinematically unstable uh, vehicle. So if, if you have a good test with a pickup truck, it, it's probably going to perform very well with, uh, with more typical passenger cars. But um, this particular vehicle is striking the barrier uh, at a 25-degree angle and 100 kilometers per hour. And um, you notice that uh, what, what we would like to achieve uh, when we have an impact with a guardrail is we want to redirect the vehicle away from the hazardous object. So the, the vehicle is... Uh, is striking the barrier, and the barrier is uh, redirecting it away from that steep side slope or that tree or that utility pole uh, that, perf that uh, constitutes the hazard. Uh, we like the vehicle to be re redirected more or less parallel to the guardrail if we can, and the idea being that the driver can uh, either regain control or stop the vehicle uh, before uh, interacting with other traffic or another hazard. Uh, in this particular test, um, the dynamic deflection uh, of the guardrail is about one meter. Actually, I think it's 900 millimeters um, uh, more particularly. Uh, so we get about one meter of, def of dynamic deflection for this 2,000 kilogram vehicle at 100 kilometers per hour and 25 um, uh, degrees. And we can change that uh, dynamic deflection uh, somewhat by varying the post spacing uh, using a 10 gauge rail, which is 3.43 millimeters uh, thick. Uh, so there are a variety of things we can do for uh, deflection control if we. Uh, if we can't accept that, that one meter deflection. Uh, I, I wanted to just briefly mention some other types of, um, of metal beam uh, strong post barriers that I, I don't think you use in, uh, uh, in India, but, um, uh, but you might be uh, interested in, in seeing them. This is a, a barrier called the thry beam uh, barrier. This, this is really exactly the same as the standard W beam profile that uh, uh, Senso engineering makes, except we add one more corrugation. So it has three corrugations uh, instead of uh, just two. And uh, that, of course, instead of having a 305 millimeter deep section, now we have a 508 millimeter deep section. So you can cover more uh, area with that, uh, with that beam. Uh, the posts are still spaced at 1905 millimeters, uh, and the rail height has increased a little bit to 813 uh, millimeters. So it gives you a little bit uh, more uh, protection because uh, the beam is a little higher and it extends a little bit uh, lower. So this is a, a, a good barrier system. Uh, a variation on that is called the modified thry beam. Uh, it's the same uh, three-humped 
uh, beam that I showed you before. The uh, difference is it has a deep, um, a 14 inch deep, and see 14 inches is, um, I'm not sure how deep 14 inches is, I guess. Um, I guess 355 millimeter deep uh, block out with a cut on it, and uh, that, uh, that has some nice features for heavier vehicles. Uh, most of the guardrails we're going to talk about uh, today are really designed for um, passenger cars and light trucks. Uh, this barrier will actually perform with, uh, with inner city buses, large buses, uh, and even single unit trucks, uh, basically um, uh, things like your heavy goods uh, vehicles. Uh, so this is a, this is a nice uh, barrier system. Uh, going the uh, other way, um, we also uh, use uh, weak post barrier systems. The, uh, the rail element is exactly the same uh, W-beam rail element um, uh, that uh, Senzo uh, uh, produces now. But instead of having a 150 millimeter deep uh, steel post, we use just a 75 millimeter deep steel post with no uh, block out. And um, so this is, a, this is a less expensive uh, system to use. Uh, the um, the um, uh, the downside or the disadvantage to using this system is where the uh, dynamic deflection for the strong post system is one meter. The dynamic deflection for this system is three or four meters. So if you, uh, if you have the space, this is a good barrier to use because the more, the more deflection you, uh, you provide, the softer the impact is for the occupant of the vehicle. Uh, but on the other hand, if, uh, you know, if you don't have the room, if, if your trees or utility poles aren't four or five meters from the edge of the uh, roadway, then you may need to use a strong post barrier uh, in order to protect uh, people. So depending on the situation, these can be a, an effective barrier uh, as well. And I, I just wanted to show you some crash test results. Uh, actually, last year, uh, my, a colleague and I redesigned this system for the U.S. state of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and these were our crash tests uh, from that. And here you see an 820 kilogram vehicle striking the barrier at 25 degrees and 100 kilometers uh, per hour. Uh, and you can see there's, a, there's probably um, a meter and a half or two meters of uh, dynamic deflection there. Uh, on the right side, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things I, uh, I guess I specialize in doing is, uh, is, is performing finite element uh, versions of uh, crash tests. So uh, a, a physical crash test is, is a fairly expensive um, operation to, to make. There are only a few places in the world to run uh, full-scale crash tests, uh, and they're quite expensive. They, uh, nowadays, uh, a test like this would cost about 35,000 U.S. dollars, which would be, I don't know, someone can do the conversion uh, real quick uh, into rupees, but uh, that's uh, a lot of money, whereas we can do the finite element, uh, the mathematical uh, model, uh, relatively quickly and at much less expense. So, um, so we do a lot of that uh, lately. So we have a nice redirection here, uh, nice, uh, nice and stable. You notice the vehicle doesn't uh, roll or pitch, it, it stays nice and flat on the ground and redirects uh, uh, very nicely. So this is a good, good test. Uh, here we have that same 2,000 kilogram truck striking at 100 kilometers per hour and 25 degrees. Um, again, we have good stable redirection, no, uh, no uh, excessive rotations of the, uh, of the vehicle. So it's a nice, uh, nice test. What have, uh, what have guardrails done to uh, save lives? How effective have they been in other parts of the world uh, where they've perhaps been used for, uh, for longer? Uh, upgrading bridge uh, rails. Uh, I, um, uh, in, the, in the U.S., anyway, there have been uh, bridge rails, of course, on, uh, on bridges since, uh, since the beginning of time. But uh, 20 or 30 years ago, we began to upgrade those so that we knew that the bridge rail would be crash-worthy. So upgrading to a bridge rail that's uh, had its performance demonstrated in a crash test can actually reduce the uh, fatal crashes on bridge rails by 75%, so a, a tremendous uh, fatal crash reduction. Uh, likewise, installing a median barrier, um, uh, uh, and do, do we call them medians in India or are they central reserves? Are, are medians, okay. Our, our, our British friends strangely call them central reserves, but uh, by putting a median barrier in, especially on narrower uh, medians, uh, you can uh, achieve a 63% uh, reduction in fatal crashes by eliminating those median crossover crashes that are often very, uh, very serious. Uh, likewise, upgrading a median barrier, if, you know, if they're uh, deficient or non-crashworthy uh, median barriers, upgrading to one that's more effective uh, can have a similar uh, uh, fatality reductions. So, um, it's my point here is that uh, this, uh, this type of technology has been used 
uh, in a variety of other places in the world and has proven itself uh, both in crash testing uh, and in the real world. Uh, so, uh, so this is a, this is a proven technology, not just um, uh, not just uh, good ideas that are that are based on uh, on nothing. It's uh, ideas that are based on on uh, testing and experience in the field. Um, the only, the only real way to evaluate how effective a, a crash barrier is going to be is, is by doing full-scale uh, crash testing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, you, we can't design crash barriers the way, uh, the way we all uh, design things like, uh, like buildings and bridges uh, in school. Uh, a simple statics uh, just uh, doesn't, uh, um, doesn't work the same way. So the, the only way to really demonstrate whether a barrier is working properly is to account for the dynamic uh, nature of the event. And the best way to do that is by full-scale crash testing. Um, and, uh, and I might just, uh, just a, a small story. Uh, when, when I was uh, young and first getting into this field, uh, we were uh, testing a lot of uh, bridge rails. And the old AASHTO criteria for designing bridge rails was a, a static load applied on, on the rail. And we tested many of those rails, and most of them didn't survive the crash test. They didn't work well with the crash test because the static loading uh, just was not equivalent to a dynamic loading. So it's important to test these things uh, dynamically. Uh, the W beam uh, crash barrier, has, since it's been around for so long, it's been around for 40 or 50 years, uh, there's a lot of crash test experience with that barrier type. Uh, and it's, uh, and it's past one, one form or another of W beam guardrail has crashed uh, uh, every type of, um, of uh, crash testing standard in the world. The NCHRP report 350 uh, in the U.S., the uh, EU criteria, uh, the Australian uh, criteria. So a lot of crash testing experience with this particular uh, barrier. And um, again, returning to the idea of, uh, of the opportunity for, uh, for you here in, in India, there's, a, there's no need to reinvent uh, the wheel and develop uh, uh, a lot of new technology. There's a lot of very good technology available uh, out there that, that you can use here uh, on your road systems as you uh, extend and improve your, uh, your highway network. Uh, now to look at just some W-beam uh, crash test uh, results. This is, uh, again, the 2,000 kilogram truck with a, a strong post W-beam guardrail uh, uh, striking at 25 degrees. And here you can see we get a pretty good uh, stable redirection from the uh, from the vehicle, uh, get about a meter of uh, dynamic uh, deflection. So this is a good, uh, good test. This is actually, I think, the most recent uh, test that was done in the, uh, in the U.S. on the standard strong post W beam guardrail um, uh, system. Uh, this is the same test, but a view from uh, from behind uh, the rail. Uh, so again, you can see the there's good controlled uh, redirection of the uh, of the vehicle. And uh, this is uh, actually the same view, but now with a computer uh, simulation uh, in there as well. And uh, you can see we, uh, we, we can do a pretty good job of, uh, of, uh, of actually predicting the crash test results. Um, the, um, the, uh, the view on the right-hand side, the uh, analysis was actually done before we ran the crash test. Uh, it was, so it's used as a predictive tool for whether the guardrail would work. And you can see it did a pretty good job of, uh, of predicting the success of that particular test. And this is just a, an overhead view. So this is, a, this is exactly what we want the guardrail to do. We want it to redirect the vehicle away from the, the uh, hazardous objects. And you can see it, uh, it involves about five or, or so uh, posts of the guardrail uh, system in redirecting that, uh, that particular uh, barrier. <coughs> Well, um, you know, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm an academic, uh, and so you might uh, say, well, uh, that, that's nice to do tests, and it's nice to do numerical analysis, but, but when we install uh, barriers in the real world, uh, how, do they, uh, how do they perform? Well, and the, the good news is that they perform uh, quite well. This is a, a newspaper article from, uh, from the states uh, in the state of North Carolina. They decided to install a uh, median barrier on all their divided uh, highways. Uh, and where, where they once had a very large cross-median uh, crash problem, by installing barriers uh, down their medians, they've, they've virtually eliminated that problem. People don't have uh, cross-median 
uh, crashes uh, anymore. So they were able to, to make a big difference uh, in the real world by uh, installing those crash barriers. So it was a good investment uh, from, a, uh, from a public policy point of view. Uh, an another uh, case uh, uh, in point, this is a particular uh, crash uh, from the state of uh, Florida where uh, a particular road uh, didn't used to have uh, crash barriers uh, along it. Uh, they installed crash barriers to try and uh, reduce the uh, crash problem on that particular road. Uh, and this particular uh, lady's life was saved because of that. Uh, had, had she struck that barrier a few months before, or uh, rather ha had she had that accident a few months before when the crash barrier wasn't there, she probably would have been fatally injured. But by having the crash barrier there, it saved, uh, saved her life. So this is the kind of thing that we can accomplish when we, uh, uh, when we use crash barriers on our, on our roadways. So, uh, so in short, uh, why, do we, uh, why do we use crash barriers? Well, the, uh, the short reason is that, they, is that they work, they're effective. And uh, here we just see again the, uh, the redirection of the, uh, of the vehicle. So they work. They've, uh, they've, they're a proven technology that's been proven by, uh, by crash testing, by numerical analysis, and, and perhaps most importantly, uh, by, by the experience in the, uh, in the real world when we actually install these particular uh, barriers. Uh, that's the uh, that's the end of my uh, my first presentation. Anyway, uh, do we have any any questions before we uh, continue, or any discussion? Yes. Um, pro uh, the, um, the standard W-beam guardrail, uh, probably not. It, well, it, it depends, of course, on the impact conditions. If we're talking about 25 degrees and 60 miles an hour, or, I'm sorry, 100 kilometers per hour, no. Yeah, but, but it, at, uh, at, at lower angles and at, um, and at lower speeds, it will be, uh, it will be uh, effective. Um, so... Um, uh, now, there, there are crash barriers that, that can uh, redirect uh, a heavy goods vehicle um, at 60 miles an hour and 25 degrees as well. It's, it's a question of what, what you decide to install along your road. Have they done any testing with a heavy vehicle also? With, uh, with, uh, with uh, higher capacity barriers? Oh, yeah. yeah. We've done a lot of testing with higher capacity barriers. Yes. So there, there are barriers that are available, and they... Um, uh, for example, the, the one barrier I showed you, the modified Thrybeam barrier that had the three humps on it, that, uh, that barrier actually works for, for heavier vehicles like, uh, like intercity buses, uh, school buses, and also um, uh, uh, the, uh, the standard uh, single unit uh, truck in, in the uh, U.S. test procedures is a um, uh, 8,000 pound, which um, see, in kilos that would be... Um, it's not as heavy as one of your heavy goods vehicles, but it's a, a heavier vehicle. So, um, so yes, there are barriers available for that, um, but no, the standard 27-inch uh, high W-beam barrier um, uh, wouldn't work at 60 miles an hour and uh, 25 degrees. But uh, the other thing to remember, too, is the, uh, the idea of crash, te or crash conditions. We, uh, we test barriers for the, for the worst reasonable case, so the 100 kilometers per hour and 25 degrees. Most crashes happen at smaller speeds and smaller, um, smaller angles, and so they're effective for larger vehicles at those smaller, um, smaller angles. In some countries like Australia, they're using wire of safety and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. Uh, how does it compare with that safety wire based on your experience? Well, actually, wire rope is, is, is another good barrier. Now, it, it, um, it won't help a truck at all, um, but... Uh, but wire rope safety fence uh, is a good uh, barrier if you have a lot of space. The, uh, the trouble with wire rope is that uh, you have to have about four meters of uh, deflection distance uh, you know, to accommodate the stretch of the, uh, of the cable. Um, and so it, where it's often used is uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of places use it in, in the median because you have a lot of space in, in the median. Uh, but it's very good for passenger cars uh, where you have a lot of space. Um, and I think in Australia, I know Australia uses a lot of uh, 
cable guardrail. Uh, in, in the western states in the U.S., uh, a lot of cable guardrail is used. Uh, and uh, also in parts of Great Britain, a lot of cable guardrail is used. But the places where they typically use them are, are um, out, outside urban areas and rural areas where you have a lot of space, but you have steep side slopes and things like that that you need to protect. I think with the road failure, there is some disadvantage. It cannot redirect Uh, well, actually, they, they do redirect. Uh, yeah, they they, they, they redirect. Um, the, actually, the, the I think probably the biggest people that uh, don't like wire rope barriers, the uh, or the the thing that they complain most about is that when you hit a uh, a wire rope barrier, you destroy a lot of barriers. So you'll have, uh, uh, you know, you might have to replace uh, twenty or thirty posts and uh, and two hundred feet of of cable barrier, whereas with a metal beam barrier, you might have to replace four or five or six posts and maybe two or three panels of barrier. So the, the maintenance cost on cable barriers can, can be high because so much of it is uh, destroyed. So there's a, there's a little bit of a cost-benefit um, uh, issue that goes into choosing which one, which one you like best. But they do, they do redirect um, pretty nice. Well, actually, that's the difference between uh, the U.S. Uh, standard and the um, and the European standard. In the U.S., there isn't a, a limit on the amount of deflection. Um, uh, where that comes in is where you decide which barrier to put in which locations. So um, uh, it's it's okay to have a barrier that has one meter dynamic deflection, two, three, whatever. But uh, but you need to place uh, the appropriate barrier in the in the appropriate uh, situation. So if you're using a uh, if you have an object that's one, you know, let's say a meter and a half from the edge of the road, you would want to use a strong post uh, metal beam guardrail that has a dynamic deflection of a meter or less. Whereas if that same pole is five meters away, you could use a cable barrier or a weak post medium barrier. No, the point is that normally the barriers in the condition they are put on the shoulders. Right. Yeah, that, that, actually, that's a good argument for using metal beam barriers again, uh, because it, uh, at the break point of the slope at the edge of the shoulder, uh, and you can do that because with the metal beam barrier, the vehicle never really gets off into the uh, steep part of the slope or the soft shoulder, whereas with the weak post barriers, they do. So if uh, so, you know, they may, if you were going to allow that uh, deflection, they may actually. You know, go down into the into the slope. 